Welcome everybody on this wonderful convocation day. Thank you all for coming, even though I know we're convocating. We didn't intend that a conflict with Dr. Steinberg, but I'm so happy to see you all here um, to attend his talk. So welcome. And uh, I'm going to get started. I don't see, oh, there's Paul and Dana back there. Am I all okay for Zoom? Zoom and everything good? Okay, perfect. All right, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend and someone who actually inspires me very much with his scientific productivity and his um, innovative science, Dr. Greg Steinberg. And I think most of you know who he is, but I'm still going to tell you about his career path, which is amazing. Dr. Steinberg is a professor of medicine at McMaster University. He holds a tier one Canada research chair and the J. Bruce Duncan Endowed Chair in Metabolic Diseases. And he's a co-director for the Center of Metabolism, Obesity and Diabetes Research, affectionately known as MOTOR. Greg completed his PhD in 2002 at the University of Guelph, and there he studied muscle metabolism. He did postdoctoral research for five years at the University of Melbourne in molecular biology and protein biochemistry, and in 2008 came back to Canada as an associate professor and joined the Department of Medicine at McMaster. So Greg's research um, studies cellular energy sensing mechanisms and how endocrine factors, lipid metabolism, and insulin sensitivity are all linked and contribute to the development of um, obesity, as well as many other disease processes, including type 2 diabetes, NASH, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. So the wonderful link, of course, with the CDCR is that um, we really hope to learn from, to apply techniques such as the ones that Dr. Steinberg uses and has developed to the study of cancer. And uh, that's why it's really a great uh, um, opportunity to understand more about his research today and his interest in cancer. Um, so Greg has published over 220 papers since 2020, and I still remember his beautiful Nature Medicine paper. He's made the list of the world's most highly cited researchers, and many of these studies have laid foundations for therapies that have recently been approved or are in clinical trials for liver disease and cardiovascular disease. His scientific contributions have been recognized by the Endocrine Society, Diabetes Canada, CIHR, and the American Diabetes Association, who have presented him with outstanding or early career scientific research awards. So with that uh, introduction, please help me welcome Dr. Greg Steinberg. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That was a long introduction. I didn't think you'd read all of it. Okay. <laughs> nice, uh, nice to be here. And... Uh, you know, the, very nice to be part of the CDCR and uh, seeing it grow, you know, it's so exciting to see uh, all the great initiatives and to see the labs full and uh, all the students interacting again. And certainly uh, we hope to be a, a major contributor to that growth as well. Uh, these are some disclosures related to uh, consulting work, um, research funding. Um, Relative to today's talk, you know, I do uh, receive funding from Espervita Therapeutics, and I'm a shareholder and founder of this company. And uh, pr um, probably most important for this crowd, I'm not an immunologist or oncologist, okay? So to save the hard questions for, uh, you know, Carl and uh, Sheila or wh whoever did those experiments that I'm going to show, okay? That's a good part about uh, giving a talk at your home institution. Hopefully, I can point out to the person who actually did the experiment so they can answer the question. So thank you uh, for being here. So, you know, we got interested in this field a few years ago uh, around the concept that obesity is a major driver of fatty liver disease. And, you know, fatty liver disease is uh, characterized by steatosis. Uh, over 5% of the liver becomes uh, fatty. Um, and that's why the name is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's not associated with alcohol intake. And, you know, the hepatologist will describe this. Uh, you'll see reviews all the time. This is benign, right? And uh, you read this, and I always tell my students when they write that, that's wrong. That's, it's not a benign phenotype. It's a, a serious phenotype because it drives metabolic disease. It's a cause of metabolic disease. So when we start getting a little bit of fat in the liver, this drives atherosclerosis development by impinging on our uh, production of cholesterol and triglycerides. It also drives uh, the development of insulin resistance. So we start to develop uh, increases in gluconeogenesis, uh, which elevates blood glucose levels and in turn leads to insulin resistance and diabetes. So, you know, fatty liver is a cause of two major uh, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So it's not benign at all. 
So with respect to other implications here, we are also very interested in how it drives fibrosis and inflammation. And this is where the hepatologists come to play. <clears throat> and so it can drive inflammation and uh, ER stress. And over time, this can drive fibrosis. And this is where you know, cirrhosis develops and can be very, very important. And in approximately 5% of people per year with cirrhosis will develop liver cancer. And so this is really where the, uh, this project developed from. This concept that if we treat fatty liver disease, there's this co strong connection with uh, liver cancer. And one of the reasons we're really interested in this is because you know, it's one thing if someone gets fatty liver disease when they're 50 or 60, which would be typical, but we know there's an obesity epidemic in children. So we're getting kids with eight, nine years old having fatty liver disease. Obviously you have a lot more time to develop through this process. So we're gonna get kids in uh, liver disease developing much earlier. And you know, we saw this developing, I worked on obesity and we go, well, what's gonna be the consequence? I bet it, there's gonna be an epidemic of NASH and HCC when I started working on obesity in 2005. And uh, well, I guess I turned out to be right um, because we know that now have HCC is the most common cancer worldwide. Uh, you know, it's not driven anymore by viral uh, driven disease, hepatitis, but in fact, it's NASH that's the primary cause of the disease. And you know, it's the only cancer increasing in both incidence and mortality of the US. So um, very stark statistics because the three year, uh, five year survival rate for advanced HCC is still only 3%. So uh, really devastating disease. And so, you know, since we started this project uh, many years ago, seven, well, probably 10 years ago now, uh, eight years ago, you know, the first line therapy was serafinib, and this was this tyrosine kinase inhibitor, what that was originally developed for other cancers, shown to have a small effect, you know, extend life by like three months, maybe, in people with advanced HCC and was improved. Uh, since then, we've developed a, a few more uh, just in the last three, uh, three years as far as frontline therapies, second line therapies. Um, and you know, we're still not really pushing up survival rates for advanced disease. And, you know, deficiencies in current therapeutics really involve, uh, you know, we're not targeting metabolic drivers of HCC progression and NASH and aggression. Um, they're really only indicated in advanced HCC. And, you know, we're often limited by complications of co comorbid liver disease and kidney disease. So this may implicate uh, impact how we can treat the disease. And one of the things, you know, immunotherapy, obviously a game changer for many cancers, but uh, in hepatitis uh, driven disease, it may be effective where many of the initial trials were done. But this study published uh, two years ago now showed that people with NAFLD or NASH driven HCC uh, do not respond to uh, immunotherapy in the same way. And actually, if anything, uh, you know, their survival is not enhanced with the ICIs. And in fact, if anything, it's driving inflammation and fibrosis in these people with NASH driven HCC. So it, making the disease worse. So clearly immunotherapy, not a, a, a great option for non NAFLD or NAFLD HCC driven disease. And so what might be the mechanism for that? Obviously, everyone here is uh, quite aware about the importance of the tumor microenvironment and mechanisms driving in most immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment in HCC is really uh, not fully understood, I would say. You know, there's all these different cell types uh, that have been implicated in potentially contributing to this uh, immuno uh, resistance, uh, but uh, which ones are the key effectors, really not clear. I'll talk a bit today about work we've been generating around uh, a role of the B cell, which looks interesting. And so, you know, we started this question quite a few years ago now, trying to evaluate what are the key pathways driving the development of NASH driven HCC. And so our, our expertise is in metabolism. So of course, we think that's the center of everything. And uh, if we look at aerobic uh, glycolysis uh, in a hepatocyte or other cell types, uh, we have an excess of glucose in the system in many, in many instances. 
We also have an insulin resistant adipose tissue, which is a characteristic of obesity. And, uh, and this leads to excess spillover of free fatty acids, uh, which enters beta oxidation. And collectively, you know, glycolysis and beta oxidation feeds into increases in acetyl CoA, which then feed into the TCA cycle. And so this TCA cycle, in the absence of pull on the system or increased energetic demands, citrate will accumulate in the cell. And this citrate has to go somewhere or else the whole TCA cycle backs up. It doesn't have the capacity to store carbon. And so the citrate, uh, the mitochondria exports that citrate out of the mitochondria. And from here, uh, it is converted back to acetyl-CoA by this enzyme ATP citrate lyase and then into fatty acids through uh, the acetyl-CoA carboxylase pathway, and then all the fatty acid synthase and fatty acids. And so, you know, at the bottom of this pathway, we have ACLY converting that acetyl-CoA uh, citrate back into acetyl-CoA in the cytosol. ACLY also converts the oxalo uh, uh, citrate to oxaloacetate, which is a, a precursor for gluconeogenesis. Um, it is also a, pre, a driver of a sterol synthesis or cholesterol synthesis. And collectively, we know, you know high levels of glucose, insulin, and sterols and fatty acids all drive NASH and HCC. There's lots of associations between elevations in these pathways and NASH-driven HCC. So uh, several years ago, we thought you know, this might be important. And one of the key ways we were interested in targeting this was through this metabolic enzyme, the AMP activated protein kinase, which I started working on about uh, 25 years ago, just after there, it was uh, shortly after it was cloned. And so, you know, we got into the cancer area and asking sort of a, a simple question, what happens if we remove AMP kinase in the absence of P53? And we saw that indeed, uh, you know, mice lacking both AMP kinase and P53 uh, died much sooner. And uh, this suggested that AMPK was suppressing uh, some cancer pathways or uh, survival pathways and allowing these tumors to grow uh, faster in mice lacking P53. And we know P53, you know, in HCC, uh, quite heterogeneous tumors, but P53 are very, very common. Of course, P53 null mice don't develop HCC tumors. They die of a lymphoma. One of the challenges, though, with working on AMP kinase is that it phosphorylates a lot of different things. Over 100 uh, distinct substrates, as we recently described in this review, uh, and you can do, link it to autophagy, cell cycle, cytoskeletal uh, channels, uh, immunity, carbohydrate metabolism, fatty acid metabolism, and cholesterol metabolism. So we tried to nail this down several years ago by making the first uh, uh, knock-in mice and this was back in the day, way before CRISPR, where you had to actually do flocks to alleles and make knock-in mice the, uh, the hard way, an expensive way. But what we did here was generate mice lacking these key phosphorylation sites on ACC, uh, which we predicted would be uh, contributing to the flux of fatty acids. And what uh, Morgan found in this experiment initially in the liver, we saw it did it see increases in lipid accumulation just with these single SNPs in the mice of the liver. So AMPK was able to phosphorylate all its other substrates, no problem. It was just uh, this single SNP. And we saw lipid accumulation. We saw early stages of liver fibrosis as well as insulin resistance in these otherwise young healthy mice. So this was really the first connection between AMP kinase, acetyl-CoA carboxylase and liver fibrosis that had been described. And so we got these information and, you know, this was pretty exciting to us. And uh, we started moving into the cancer area. And this was a project led by James uh, Laley, who's in the crowd here. And, you know, uh, I remember talking to him maybe 10 years ago, telling him, you know, I think we might start working in this cancer metabolism area. It looks interesting. So why don't we start uh, applying some of what we learned about metabolism into this area. And he, he agreed, he, maybe 
rightly or wrongly, but um, <laughs> he went along with it. And uh, so we generated, uh, we generated a lot of new models in this area in these ACC knock-in mice. And what he found was that if we knocked in this mutation and fed the mice a high fructose diet and introduced a DNA instability using the diethyl nitrosamine, uh, we could upregulate the lipogenic pathway. AMPK was still normal and the, all the other uh, lipogenic enzymes were normal. But uh, we did see increased number of lesions, hepatic lesions were increased in these ACC knock-in mice, especially on the high fructose diet, which accelerates de novo lipogenesis. This effect was also observed uh, in a CRISPR cell line where we mutated these knock -in, this knock-in mutation. You know, AMP kinase activity was normal, just ACC was altered. And again, we saw increases in lipogenesis and increases in proliferation. So this really laid the foundation for the concept that AMPK phosphorylation of ACC was critical for driving proliferation uh, in cancer cells, at least in the liver. And this company Nimbus was uh, smart enough to develop uh, based on our findings of this phosphorylation site, that a compound that bound to this exact same residue that we described for AMPK. And uh, it displaced the AMPK phosphorylation site. And they went on to show uh, uh, that this compound uh, inhibited tumor nodule formation in this uh, NASH-driven HCC model and also increased survival, suggesting that it was a, a critical residue controlling uh, proliferation in the liver. And this led to the concept that you know, both AMP kinase and this compound uh, could control hepatocellular carcinoma through the regulation of de novo lipogenesis as a key aspect driving disease development. And uh, really laid the foundation for you know, multiple clinical trials where AMP kinase activators, uh, beta-1 activators have been used in NASH uh, and multiple ACC inhibitors have been developed uh, that have been shown to all reduce de novo lipogenesis in the liver and reduce NASH. Unfortunately, you know, there's uh, problems with some efficacy of some of these compounds. Some of them are not the most potent. And with respect to uh, ACC inhibitors, especially, a big problem is that they increase serum triglycerides. And this is a problem in a, a, a population that is already has a cardiometabolic disease because this increases the risk of cardiovascular disease as well as pancreatitis. And you know the levels of triglycerides that we see in this situation are quite high. So this has led to all these companies developing you know, combo therapies potentially to get this ACC inhibitors into markets. But uh, certainly it provides validation that our work in mice certainly uh, translated to humans and uh, led to this concept that DNL was important. And so here's the diagram again. We have AMPK, ACC inhibitors uh, feeding into this reaction. And you know, after getting these data, we started thinking, well, wh what happens you, you know, if we work downstream of here or upstream, depending on where you're looking at it? And can we starve the whole pathway of substrate by targeting ATP citrate lyase, right? And essentially we could starve ACC of substrate potentially uh, blocking this reaction. And that's really what the data I'll talk to you about today is our uh, efforts around this area. And so potentially thinking about that ACCL, ACLY inhibition could be effective. And so the key question of course was, can we first see some effects genetically uh, whether genetic inhibition of ACLY could exert therapeutic effects in NASH-driven HCC. And to test this, you know, we wanted to get a really robust model to test this. We, you know, doing uh, a lot of people had done xenographs and other work. Obviously, these are not great models when you're trying to uh, look at the tumor microenvironment interactions, which are so important in NASH HCC. So, uh, we injected mice with diethyl nitrosamine, as I've shown before, which in introduces these DNA adducts. But what we did in this situation was after the two, week in at two weeks of age, uh, uh, Jai and James injected these mice with the diethyl nitrosamine, but then they put them on this Western diet, high fat and fructose diet combined and housed the mice at thermoneutrality as well. And what, what you can see here is that this really accelerates disease development 
And uh, the number of visible tumors on the liver is uh, greatly increased uh, with the NASH HCC diet compared to the control diet. And these tumors are also much more aggressive. They're neoplastic lesions, not uh, just altered foci, uh, suggesting we are driving disease progression. And transcriptionally, they're also very similar. And I won't show that data as well. But when we look at uh, pathology here, here we have a chow den liver. NASH den liver, we have ballooning of the hepatocytes, we have a lot of uh, intracellular uh, uh, steatosis, microvesicular and macrovesicular steatosis. And you, you know, these are very similar to the human NASH. And if we look at the tumor specifically, we also see this intratumoral steatosis, which is probably really important. And there's yeah, clinical evidence to suggest this is, is a key driver of uh, disease severity. And, and this steatosis and microvesicular steatosis, as well as the ballooning uh, within the tumor, is also seen in human uh, NASH situation. So very different disease uh, pathologically compared to the viral driven hepatocellular carcinoma, suggesting you know, the model we were testing was very much aligned with uh, the human condition. And so uh, to look at this, you know, we're always interested in trying to study uh, genetics in a way that just doesn't prevent disease and minimizing uh, complications associated with uh, uh, intervention from a lifelong deletion of a gene. So uh, we, uh, as in James and uh, uh, Marissa set up this model where we got ACLY flocks animals. Uh, we developed uh, AV8, TTR Cree uh, specific promoter where we could get the mice up to a certain age, uh, get them established with disease, and then inject them with the Cree or the uh, YFP to induce deletion. So much like you would with a drug, you know, we're not just trying to prevent disease from happening from an early age. We're trying to treat it from a, an established situation. And in data that was published last year that Marissa showed, you know, in hepatocytes using this method, we got a fantastic uh, knockdown of ACLY. Um, we also got the expected changes in metabolism, you know, reductions in sterile synthesis, fatty acid synthesis, increases in fatty acid oxidation, hitting all the things that we would expect with uh, inhibiting ACLY activity. So what happened in the mice? Uh, well, this is the experiment that we uh, did to investigate this. Uh, so injection of the mice at two weeks of age, starting the mice on the NASH diet at eight weeks of age, taking them out for 20 weeks, and then in doing the injection. So the time point where we know they have established NASH, HCC, and then injecting them with either the YFP or the Cree virus. And you know what Jaya and James found was really quite uh, remarkable in that the ACLY knockout mice had really a large change in liver histology, uh, a large reduction in the number of visible tumors. And you could see here, you know, in the wild type group, almost all the animals had over 60 tumors, uh, whereas none of the animals in the knockout mice had uh, any tumors. And, you know, you can imagine if potentially we had extended out this experiment even longer, potentially there might have been no tumors. I don't know. We don't know what would happen. But clearly big phenotypic differences uh, between the wild type and knockout using this very specific uh, hepatocyte-driven CRE, uh, uh, which is also actually also expressed in the tumors. Um, and, you know, if we look at the severity of the tumors, the number of neoplastic lesions was all eliminated in many, many of these animals. So we're getting targeting the most severe tumors and the most aggressive tumors with the ACLY knockout. And this great histology was done. Uh, we were fortunate to work with Elam, who was a pathologist working with uh, Teos, uh, Zacharias up at the Cancer Center, and it really helped us out characterizing all these lesions. And so um, if we looked at these also, other ways, what was going on, you know, this was really quite striking to us. As I was mentioning to us, these tumors have this intratumoral steatosis, microvesicular, macrovesicular steatosis uh, within the tumor. And the knockout animals had no uh, steatosis and or much greatly reduced uh, macrovesicular steatosis. Lipid area went down. We measured this biochemically using mass spectrometry. So we were effectively draining the tumor of the lipid by knocking out ACLY, which was really uh, pretty interesting given that it's uh, been associated with prognosis in HCC. 
And so what mechanisms then might be important for driving this reduction in steatosis and, uh, and also the reduced tumor burden in the ACLY knockout mice was the obvious question. And, you know, we had lots of speculations, but um, we didn't know. So we ran RNA sequencing and, you know, when, what we found was really quite surprising to us because we had no idea uh, that this was going to happen in that the top signatures that were upregulated were all to do with uh, leukocyte proliferation, leukocyte migration, lymphocyte proliferation, and apoptotic signaling pathways. And so this was, you know, we manipulated a gene responsible for fatty acid and sterile synthesis, and we got all these immune signatures uh, which is something that wasn't on our radar at all uh, on the time when we got this data four or five years ago, probably, well, three or four years ago at the time now. And so this was really, really surprising to us that the top gene signature was all this immune signature within the tumors. And, you, you know, we looked at this multiple ways, or Jin Hun did, where he quantified re relationship between ACLY and in particular B cells fell out of this signature really dramatically where there was a very tight correlation between ACLY expression and B cells. And I should note that, you know, we did this at two different time points, this RNA sequencing, because I'm, you know, I'm always really concerned about, you know, what's cause and effect, right? Causation, could they just have altered immune infiltration because the tumors are a different size or dead? So we did this experiment, you know, at four weeks and eight weeks. And at four week time point, there was no change in tumor volume yet. And so and yet these B cells were already there, suggesting they were a driver of the phenotype, not just responding to the reduction in tumor burden. So this was pretty awesome and uh, really uh, exciting for us that uh, manipulating the ACLY only in the tumor or the, in the liver was having this big immune phenotype. And so uh, we wanted to an analyze this a bit more. And, you know, Jonathan uh, Bramson had just bought this new toy, this Mibitoff. And we go, oh, wow, this would be a good application of this. It sounds like something we should do. And uh, so we were fortunate enough to work with Jamie McNichol, who set up the first uh, antibody panel for mice. I think, uh, and we were, our samples were the first ones to go through there. And so we did the, uh, so he did a lot of analysis here. And I, I don't see Jamie here, is he? Okay, no, he's not. Okay, too bad, because if there's hard questions, see, I can't ask him. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he generated these data where he has really showed that uh, through the scan of targeted scan at the single cell level with these gold labeled antibodies, he could show that this immune infiltration, you know, there wasn't enough cells, T cells for him to confirm that there were T cells, but, or B cells, but, and he didn't have a marker for B cells specifically, but certainly in the ACLY knockout, he saw more tumor infiltrating lymphocytes uh, at the similar matching up with, with what we got in the bulk RNA sequencing. And uh, he noticed these were especially relevant in region two and region four of the uh, using the Mibitoff analysis. So very much aligning up with our gene expression data where we did see this increase in tumor infiltrating lymphocytes into, uh, into the tumors of the ACLY knockout mice. And, you know, importantly, we were seeing reductions in uh, uh, proliferation as we expected, but we were also seeing increases in apoptosis uh, as measured through immunofluorescence and consistent with the RNA sequencing data, suggesting that you know, we were not only slowing down proliferation, but also increasing apoptosis and killing the tumors. And this is, was a key driver of why these ACLY knockout mice had lower uh, tumor burden. So of course, the next question becomes, well, we see this immune infiltration, why is that? You know, what, where is this, what is driving uh, the system to pick up all these immune cells and why would they come into this uh, tumor? And again, we turn to our, our RNA sequencing data and here, as I'm showing, you know, we did this at early and late time points, the four week time point, the late time point, the early time point was before there were differences in tumor size. And here you can see all the, you know, the upregulated terms here, all to do with B cells, T cell proliferation, T cell activation, all upregulated. And downregulated terms, you know, was really, really puzzling to us because we expected ACLY to be enhancing fatty acid oxidation, oxidative metabolism, 
but actually it was shutting down uh, metabolic processes, cytoplasmic translation, biosynthetic processes, mitochondrial respiration, aerobic respiration. So all these respiratory pathways actually were uh, downregulated. And uh, we didn't really have an explanation for that other than uh, it's uh, there must be some some sort of mitochondrial program going on that it's impact, Im impacting it and and you know it, then this paper came out in Nature uh, about a year ago where they identified that in you know pluripotent stem cells uh, or rapidly dividing cells that ACLY is actually they called it a non-canonical a non component of the TCA cycle in that, you know, citrate going to oxaloacetate, ACLY can take on that role and that it's, it's critical for driving uh, cell proliferation in non-canonical cells and something we hadn't appreciated. And here you can see what happens is that when you knock out ACLY, you get increases in citrate as you would expect um, but what also happens is that the TCA cycle shuts down and becomes uh, uh, much lower. So you get lower levels of succinate, uh, fumarate, malate, aspartate. And so the whole rest of the TCA cycle shuts down without ACLY, which of course was very consistent with our gene signature showing here. And uh, really, really uh, something that we hadn't anticipated happening. And so uh, Jaya then... Uh, uh, I think we sent these to uh, uh, to do metabolomics in uh, the City of Hope and uh, the University of Vic Metabolomics Center. And uh, what we found, uh, we did see increases in citrate and we saw large reductions in succinate, 23% uh, reduction in succinate and downregulation of these uh, key enzymes uh, generating succinate. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, two, uh, just last, uh, a few months ago, these two papers came out where these succinate seems to be a key driver of suppressing T cell function. And so succinate inhibits T cell function and T cell activation. And we think probably B cell activation as well. And, uh, you know, it's something we haven't done, but this is an experiment we need to do uh, to really probably nail down the mechanism here that uh, this increase in succinate or reduction in succinate is then allowing B cells and T cells to become active in the tumor microenvironment, thereby inducing uh, uh, apoptosis. So, you know, this is what we've shown so far. Um, uh, we, should, we show that inhibition of a ACLY, you know, as expected, given our previous studies, uh, we saw reductions in proliferation and, you know, this is consistent with what we would anticipate given the reduction in fatty acid and sterile synthesis where, you know, a rapidly dividing cell needs to use these uh, macromolecules to divide. Um, but, you know, unexpectedly, we see this interaction with the immune system, which we had not expected and in increases in apoptosis. And we believe this is largely driven downstream of ACLY through remodeling of the TCA cycle and reductions in succinate, which then promote activation of the T cell and B cell in the tumor microenvironment, allowing these cells to work more effectively to induce apoptosis. And so that, you know, that was pretty cool, we thought, and exciting from a, a biological perspective. Of course, you know, one of the things we always want to know is can we mimic these effects uh, using a drug? Uh, rather than just a gene therapy. And this is something that uh, we've done uh, in collaboration with a, uh, we started a company and uh, you know, there's always lots of interest about doing that. So I'll, I'll show you a few pieces of data uh, that we've generated using uh, our compound that uh, James and Jaya uh, developed in combination with a medicinal chemistry program where we did a phenotypic screen um, in primary mouse hepatocytes uh, through a library of compounds. Um, and uh, we've identified one compound, uh, EVT185, we'll call it, uh, that uh, in, has an IC50 of you know, 0.456 micromolar for inhibiting lipogenesis. And we did a phenotypic screen using primary hepatocytes. You know, this is a blood, uh, bread and butter kind of assay in our lab where we can do this. We get very high sensitivity and we can screen a large number of compounds fairly quickly. 
from there, we uh, did a cell-free assay system uh, where we uh, looked at ACLY activity. And here we can see that uh, the prodrug EVT185 has no activity, but the CoA derivative of the uh, drug, which is a fatty acid-like moiety, uh, inhibits, the, uh, inhibits ACLY in cell-free assay system. So this was quite an important finding because we know inhibiting de novo lipogenesis in the whole body is not a good thing. You know, you inhibit de novo lipogenesis in the platelets. Uh, you don't, you get a cytopenia, platelet problems. You inhibit it in, in the brain, you might have problems. You inhibit it in muscle, you get muscle weakness. So you don't want to inhibit it everywhere. And so this was fortuitous um, in that uh, we found out that EVT circulates systemically and it's biologically inactive, uh, but in liver and uh, kidney cells, uh, we get activation of this drug uh, through uh, this enzyme ACSVL1, a long chain CoA synthetase, which adds on a CoA derivative to the, uh, to the terminal end here. And uh, this sequesters the drug in the hepatocytes and the kidney cells, proximal tubular cells. And this is the key aspect that's inhibiting ACLY activity. And how do we know this? Well, we've solved the, uh, well, we, um, I should say uh, Kenneth at the University of Belgium, uh, we sent him the compound. He uh, crystallized uh, uh, EVT185 CoA. We know uh, ACLY has a CoA binding domain. And uh, here it is, uh, it's a homoheterotrimer uh, ACLY. We basically two, we have two, two arms there. And what it's doing here is that if we blow up this, we have a solve the uh, structure at 3.25 angstroms. And what we can see here is that the EVT CoA area of the drug binds directly into the CoA binding site. And this then disrupts this uh, binding module from coming around, which allows citrate, converts uh, the citrate to oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA. So we're affecting this uh, binding module from activating uh, doing the conversion site here. So this was pretty cool that we could see this actually at the molecular level and confirm that we were uh, had a competitive inhibitor of the uh, ACLY th through this CoA binding site. And from here, you know, we've done many, many studies uh, in different mouse models. Uh, we've done one study with prevention, and here you can see uh, if we start treating with EVT-185 in mice with established NASH without HCC, uh, we can completely prevent disease development. Uh, these mice have almost no tumors. Uh, you can see the difference in the liver histology. You don't need to be a hepatologist to see uh, one good liver and one not. Uh, we can treat in a treatment setting. Uh, here you can see that uh, dose-dependent reductions in uh, tumor burden uh, in mice with active uh, HCC. Uh, we've combined this drug with radiation, and we can see that it uh, performs similar to radiation and uh, may enhance the effects of radiation to some, si uh, some degree uh, while reducing liver toxicity and inflammation. And uh, we've combined it with a number of drugs, including serafinib and levantinib, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And this work was done in Scott Friedman's lab in New York, at Mount Sinai. And we can see that you know, it performs equally well as serafinib and levantinib. And if we combine it with uh, levantinib, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, we get uh, additive effects and you know, a, a resolution of uh, disease in approximately 8% of animals, suggesting that a complete response rate is possible with the combination therapy. And uh, of course, we've tested it with a, a tezabab combination therapy and uh, see that it, it performs better than a tezabab in this NASH HCC model, suggesting that uh, you know, consistent with the clinical data, a tezabab combination doesn't work especially well in NASH-driven HCC, so uh, where our drug continues to work uh, fairly well. So these data suggest that really uh, we might have an important drug for mice, but uh, what about humans? Uh, so where do we go from here? And you know, this is where I think uh, obviously open access data and uh, uh, all the clinical data sets and linking it with your clinical phenotype is becoming very powerful and interesting. And uh, this is data as, uh, generated by Jinhan Wu, where 
he went into a clinical trial where they had NASH and NASH HCC and different tumor biopsies. And you can see that clearly ACLY expression is highest in uh, people with the NASH HCC compared to non-tumor adjacent tissue, cirrhotic liver, NASH liver, healthy liver, much, much higher uh, ACLY expression. He could then look at uh, the association with different immune infiltrates. And he can see just like we saw in the mice, there was this association between ACLY activity and B cell infiltration into the tumors. And he used multiple methods to look at this uh, association. And importantly, you know, there is this association between ACLY and activity and expression uh, in people with hepatocellular carcinoma, suggesting that it, it may also be an influencing survival. Uh, so in conclusion, you know, we think that uh, we've discovered an underappreciated mechanism uh, by which uh, altering tumor metabolism, you know, not only induces cellular quiescence and slows down the growth of uh, proliferating cells, but is also enhancing immunogenicity and promoting apoptosis. And, you know, we've shown this a couple different ways. We've used the ACLY knockout, very specific for the hepatocyte. Uh, we've generated drug EBT-185, uh, which also mimics many of these effects. And that this then alters, uh, redu reduces acetyl ACLY activity, um, uh, which then uh, lowers fatty acid uh, lipid droplets, intratumoral steatosis, probably affects uh, biomembrane synthesis, and unexpectedly also alters the TCA cycle, which may influence uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and their ability to uh, detect the tumor. And so, um, in data, I didn't have any effect time to show. We also show that the EBT-185 also has effects on fibrosis, which is uh, due to the uh, effects on the stellate cell, which is not seen in this hepatocyte-specific knockout. So in conclusion, you know, we, we think this is an interesting overlap between uh, uh, basic biology and, uh, I guess, extending it to a new, uh, a new drug that hopefully we'll someday get into people so we can uh, uh, help improve uh, those survival rates in hepatocellular carcinoma, which are so desperately needed. Okay, and so key takeaways, um, increases in lipogenesis are really a key driver of NASH HCC. I think that's uh, now well established. Um, feeding a diet high in fat and fructose replicates many of the uh, characteristics of human NASH HCC in mice. And, you know, if anyone's interested in developing models in this area, certainly we'd be happy to help. You know, uh, we have a fair bit of experience in this and we can uh, uh, also house mice at thermoneutrality, which is a temperature range, which is warmer than the standard uh, mouse house and lowers the immune activation uh, due to high levels of norepinephrine. So it brings down the metabolic rate of a mouse much more akin to that of, uh, of humans, okay? And uh, we've shown the genetic inhibition of ACLY reduces tumor oxidative metabolism and proliferation, leading to increased immunogenicity and apoptosis. And I identified a novel cell selective pro drug inhibitor of ACLY that mimics effects of genetic inhibition. And, you know, lastly, uh, and perhaps most speculative is this idea that reductions in ACLY in humans with NASH HCC are associated with increased tumor infil immune infiltration and survival. Of course, we'll need to test that more, uh, but using the clinical data sets that are available so far, uh, it suggests there might be something there. And so uh, lastly, uh, here's uh, the team, uh, Jaya, you've probably seen her around. She's right in the middle there in the orange, yes. Uh, she was a, a big leader of this and along with James, as I mentioned, really getting us started in the liver cancer area and developing a lot of models. And here we have uh, uh, Jin Han and uh, Fiorella also involved with a lot of these studies. But overall, the team works all together on the, all these projects and everyone kicks in and helps out. So it wouldn't be possible without them all working hard and doing all this great work and allowing me to talk about it. Thank you. So Greg, thank you for that amazing talk. Um, I, I think you've definitely sp spurred the interest of people in the room to collaborate. Um, 
I'm going to open to questions. Does anyone have a question for Dr. Steinberg? Laura. Yeah, that's certainly what we think. Uh, you know, we think that uh, this application could apply to multiple tumor types, not just liver tumors. Any cold tumor could be potentially made hot with uh, reprogramming and combining with immunotherapy. Of course, you know, we don't have data to support that yet. I, I think uh, those experiments are in the pipeline, but uh, certainly uh, something that we would expect to see greater uh, efficacy with the uh, uh, immunotherapies. Yeah, so I actually had a similar question to, to what Lara just asked, because I'm also fascinated by the immunogenicity effect. And, um, and the potential application to cold tumors. But I'm just wondering, what do you think it would take um, to engineer a tissue specific approach for different cancers? Because I imagine, obviously you don't want global effects of, of a drug targeting ACLY, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think uh, one of the challenges with the, uh, uh, can you do a genetic instrument? Of course, yeah. I mean, I guess that's possible now to you obviously use siRNA and target different cell types using uh, targeted sequencing. Uh, you know, our drug specifically, we expected to have effects in the liver and uh, kidney, which improves the safety profile of the drug, but it, is it possible to use another targeting sequence to try to get it to other cell types? Right. Certainly would be uh, the way to go about it. You know, with respect to glioblastoma, obviously fatty acids don't necessarily get across the blood brain barrier that well. And we know the brain doesn't have SGLT, uh, the SLC2782, but, you know, glioblastoma cells, you know, there's been two or three papers in the last year yeah. showing that they're yeah. highly dependent on DNL, which makes sense because there's no exogenous fatty acids there. Yeah, exactly right. And, um, you know, I imagine that you're already discuss discussing with Espervita about um, drug delivery as well in terms of how you would actually get this into patients. Yeah, I mean, a, a, for the liver and kidney, it's fair, it's orally bioavailable. It gets in there, no problem. But the brain, yeah, and that would be something that would be a, a great idea. Yeah, very exciting. Any, uh, Carl, please. Very nice talk. I was wondering if uh, any comment on this observation of T cells. So, uh, you know, a lot of Yeah, I mean, it's I, you know, I, I'm not, like I said, I'm not an immunologist. So what they're doing there, I've read some review articles. I've seen, well, some are pro tumor genic, some are anti tumor genic depending what they're doing. I mean, my simple view of immunology is that they would be there priming the system, obviously, for the T cells, but I don't, uh, we haven't got down that route far enough to know exactly what subsets of B cells or what types of B cells they are, uh, what, uh, uh, what cytokines these B cells are secreting. Mm -hmm. I don't know that answer yet. Sounds like a good question for a collaboration. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Hong, please. And then Tobias. And the risk you should add, uh, will that also impact in the timing of the drug treatment? Is that can causing further evolution of certain tumor population to having potentially pathway to that particular dominant? Good question. Yeah, Could you yeah, very good. Yeah, so the question was, uh, you know, where in the cell, uh, where in the tumor cell ACLY is most active, right? I think that was the general gist of it. I mean, it, I think we've done some immunofluorescence experiments, right, Jaya? 
it's not in the paper, but it, we see more ACLY, you know, around the, around the edge of the tumor, you know, interfacing with the tumor microenvironment at the growth region, not in the necrotic area. And, you know, this is consistent where there's rapid proliferation going on. Uh, certainly, um, you know, this is something we're interested in pursuing more. I, I don't know, did we do RNA scope also? I don't know in the tumor, but certainly uh, using um, spatial transcriptomics and other pathways. I mean, I think this is really exciting to look at this uh, localization of ACLY. ACLY has also been shown to be found in the nucleus, not just a cytosol. So there's, uh, that's where it's supposedly regulating acetylation status, where there's a local pool of ACLY converting uh, it might be important. So uh, there's, and also potentially in, you know, uh, proxosomes and other areas. So it's a lot to figure out about it for sure. Tobias. A great question. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're certainly aware of that literature. We have not, none of our models have been designed to have metastases, but it's something that has been brought up several times that this uh, switch to uh, fatty acid oxidation, you know, it may be important for metastasis and uh, uh, something that we have not been able to uh, tease out using our models yet, but happy to uh, brainstorm about how we could do that. Yeah, that would be a great because idea. I think it, you know, we're very interested in, you, you know, the concept that colorectal tumors will uh, uh, metastasize to the liver, and they might all be active with SL, be active in to the drug and uh, certain areas like that, but also in the brain and other areas. I think it would be really uh, great if we could think about uh, other models that we could test this hypothesis. Yeah, there's a lot of papers that are actually that are published in GBM about fatty acid synthase um, and governing the infiltrative invasive nature of GBM. And so knocking it out reduces just the same thing that Tobias is saying about metastasis, but in the setting of local brain infiltration is reduced. And so um, I think it would be really interesting to model this in terms of the effect on metastases, because mm -hmm. then as Laura suggested, you have not only HCC as a, as a cancer target for this drug, but other cancers that are cold, have a cold microenvironment and then preventing cancers from spreading could convert a disease that is incurable to a locally treatable disease again, right? So it's really exciting. Yes, please. Um, I don't know. How would we measure that? <laughs> okay. Did we do that? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, did we? Jai is writing notes, right? Yeah. Jai is Jai writing, writing notes. notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. That would be good. Yeah, I, you know, we haven't looked at, uh, have we done anything like that, Jaya? No? Okay. Good. Yeah, I mean, I, we don't know, uh, because of this acetylation change, ACLY being the nucleus, you know, there's all this histone acetylation, which could be very important. And uh, Yeah, Okay, well, be exciting to look into that, see if that's the cause. Okay, thank you. Good. Any other questions for Professor Steinberg? If not, you guys know where to find him. So please do come and talk that's to him right. more about cancer. He's right, right embedded right with us. <laughs> so we're hoping that, that uh, having invited Dr. Steinberg today will give further room for collaboration with CDCR members. There's so much exciting work happening in the Steinberg lab and it will be great to collaborate. So thank you so much for coming okay, to speak well, today, Greg. Yeah, help me thank you. Thank you.